This evening's reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 to 15. And that can be found on page 1165 in the Church Bibles. Before reading, let's pray. Lord God, praise you that your word has divine power to destroy strongholds and take thoughts captive under the Lordship of Christ. We pray this evening as we read your word, please would expose areas of our lives sealed off from your Lordship and bring all of our desires and affections in line with your will. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So reading from 2 Corinthians, chapter 11, starting at verse 1. I hope you will put up with me in a little foolishness. Yes, please put up with me. I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the snake's cunning your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the spirit you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. I do not think I am in the least inferior to those super apostles. I may indeed be untrained as a speaker, but I do have knowledge. We have made this perfectly clear to you in every way. Was it a sin for me to lower myself in order to elevate you by preaching the gospel of God to you free of charge? I robbed other churches by receiving support from them so as to serve you. And when I was with you and needed something, I was not a burden to anyone, for the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied what I needed. I have kept myself from being a burden to you in any way and will continue to do so. As surely as the truth of Christ is in me, nobody in the regions of Achaia will stop this boasting of mine. Why? Because I do not love you? God knows I do. And I will keep doing on doing what I am doing in order to cut the ground from under those who want an opportunity to be considered equal with us in the things they boast about. For such people are false apostles, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising, then, if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve." Thanks for reading, Sarah. Please do keep that passage in your Bibles open. And it's really lovely to see you all this evening. My name's Adam. Um, Imagine a wedding ceremony. Everyone's dressed up. There's flowers and bunting. Guests are arriving. The minister's at the front. The groom shuffles nervously. The atmosphere is thick with anticipation. But there's a problem. You know the line in a traditional marriage service, who gives this woman to be married to this man? Well, here, the father of the bride looks terribly embarrassed. He looks devastated. The bride's not come to her own wedding. Where is she? That's the picture that Paul uses in this passage to the Corinthians. Um, Studying this book week by week, we've made it to chapter 11, Paul is writing to a church that he helps start, and so with whom he has a lot of history. And he sees it like the church is the bride, and he's almost like the father figure of the bride. But the relationship between Paul and the Corinthians has been up and down, to say the least. And the problem at the moment is that there's these false teachers who have come in and are changing the Christian message. They're impressive and boastful, but they're leading the church astray. And Paul wants the church to keep going with the true message about Jesus. And so he's heartbroken that with this tempting danger, they might not keep going. And so the question for the Corinthians 
and for us. When there's these fake alternatives to Jesus out there, do you see how high the stakes are? If you're a guest here today, you're really welcome. I hope you can see how important it is that the Jesus you hear about is the real Jesus. If there's false teaching around, the stakes are very high. Will the bride, the Corinthian church, make it to the wedding, even if there's these distractions on the way? Or will the father of the bride be arriving by himself? Our first heading, verse 1 to 4, is remember your betrothal. In verse 1, I hope you can see it, and Paul asks that the Corinthians would put up with him. And please, he says, even though there's others who want your attention, just listen to me for a little bit. That introduces our passage for today and as we go on in the section of the letter. And Paul, in verse 2, says he's jealous for you with a godly jealousy. You may remember from having read Exodus or the Ten Commandments, God describes himself as a jealous God. That is to say, as your creator and your redeemer, he doesn't want just half of you. He doesn't want to share you. God loves you, and if you belong to him, then he'll want you to be his and his alone. And Paul says he has the same kind of feeling in a similar kind of way. Remember your commitment. Remember your betrothal. And that's where our wedding illustration comes from. Look with me halfway through verse 2. Paul says, I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. Paul is putting himself in the role of the father or parent of the bride. It's like he's saying, don't you remember when you got engaged? Everyone was happy. We all agreed about this. But are you going to make it to the wedding? Throughout the Bible, God speaks to describe his people as the bride and God himself as the bridegroom. You could look in Isaiah or Ezekiel or Hosea and see God at the highest and lowest moments describing his relationship with his people in this way. Or in the New Testament, we see Jesus as the bridegroom of the church in Ephesians chapter 5, Revelation chapter 21. That picture shows us God as the faithful, committed lover of his people, that he binds himself to us. It's wonderful for us, whatever our expectation or experience with marriage or even getting engaged. If you're one of his people, Jesus loves you as his bride. And together, male or female, we're all a part of that truest reality as the church is the bride of Christ. Like in a marriage, Jesus takes anything we bring to the table our baggage, our sin, our mistakes, and he offers himself and all his spiritual riches as he becomes one with us. It means you receive a fresh start, whatever came before, and a secure promise of his love. And so today, for the Corinthians and for us, it's like we're in that engagement or betrothal period. The commitment's been made, and yet the marriage day hasn't quite yet been consummated when we meet Jesus face to face. And betrothal, it's worth saying, in the Corinthians' time and in other cultures, would have been a more definite thing than engagement is today. The betrothal would have been when you're totally committing and promising, not just that you'd like to get married, but that you promise you will get married. And that's the illustration Paul is using. But he says to the Corinthians, if you leave Christ... If you go to other lovers, that is going to break off this engagement. The pure virgin line is more talking about having a single-minded uh, single focus to Jesus now rather than what's gone before. And all of us come to Jesus with backgrounds of baggage and past messy experience. And, but he offers a totally new start and this bit here is talking about that single-mindedness in the engagement. On the wedding day, when we meet Jesus, when the Corinthians are due to meet Jesus, if the, if the groom is waiting at the front of, his, of the church for his beloved, and he hears that she's off with another man, of course he'll be heartbroken 
and jealous. And of course, the father of the bride, like Paul here, would be so ashamed. Do you see what's at stake here? Verse 3, but I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the snake's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. The Corinthian situation is linked back to the first bride, Eve in the Garden of Eden, where it's beautiful and lush and full of riches. But the serpent comes and asks Eve whether she's satisfied. Would you like even more? Craftier than any other creature, the serpent twists God's words and tempts Eve away. Come and taste this beautiful fruit. Don't worry about what God said. You can have even more. I can show you real greatness. And the false teachers are like that. Like with the bride running away or the serpent twisting away. That's how serious this is. And that's why Paul cares so much for the Corinthians. His heart breaks for them. Please see what's at stake here. Imagine, um, what would it take for um, you, what would it take for someone to have to preach something from this lectern even, um, for you to have to stand up and interrupt or walk out? Um, If someone was to call you to worship Zeus or the deification of Boris Johnson, I hope it will be quite obvious that things had gone horribly wrong. Um, But that's not what's so dangerous. Look at verse 4. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the spirit you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. See, the false teachers are more subtle than that. They don't come in preaching Zeus. They just preach that they know Jesus a bit better than anyone else and a bit differently to what you've heard before. Maybe they say, oh, we love Jesus. So where there's bits of Paul's teaching that you don't like, we can throw those out. And where there's bits of the Old Testament that don't fit with our Jesus, we'll throw those out too. And even when there's bits in the Gospels that Jesus seems to say, but they don't fit with what we know Jesus is really like, so we'll throw those out too. See, maybe you think that sounds ridiculous, or maybe you think it sounds pretty tempting. But I tell you what, it's as common today as it might have been in the Corinthians' day. A slightly different Jesus. A Jesus who perhaps fits in a bit more with the world. Or a slightly different spirit, which is more dramatic. Or a slightly different gospel, which is not so much about the cross or sin or the sacrifice. It's just slightly different from these preachers. And you've been pulled away. Paul says, you put up with that easily enough. Please, the same words in verse 1, put up with me. Don't you remember how high the stakes are? Remember your betrothal. Don't be deceived by these sneaky, snaky, slightly different preachers. Um, But what are they like? Um, We'll look at verses 5 to 12 with our second heading. Watch out for triumphalism. Now, I'm stealing that word, triumphalism, from Don Carson, who got quoted on 2 Corinthians last week. It's a word to describe the showiness or hyper-attractive, successful impressiveness of the false teachers. Paul describes them in verse 5 as super apostles. So you can imagine them in a cape or a Marvel movie if you want to. And they're obsessed with being super or triumphalist. That's why Paul gives them the silly name. And he says that you need to see through their act two ways. The first is in their speech. Paul compares himself to them in verse 6. I may indeed be untrained as a speaker, but I do have knowledge. We have made this perfectly clear to you in every way. It's like they've been boasting about being superer than Paul. They're more eloquent He's clumsy or a bit too ordinary. And I think it's understandable, isn't it? To want to hear sermons that are really eloquent and very artful and perhaps a bit funny. And maybe you wish the sermons here were a bit better. Um, But Paul's speech isn't all that impressive. And yet he can compete with them, not with their eloquence, but because he has real knowledge. The gift inside is more important than the wrapping paper on the outside. 
Last year, I was on a ministry training course, and two things they really encouraged us to have in preaching, accuracy in truth and good quality in communication. But if you can only choose one, you've got to always choose accuracy in truth. Because if you're a remarkable speaker, but teaching something wrong, that's all the more dangerous. Down the wrong path, you'll easily lead people with you. Paul can say, verse 6, I have genuine knowledge and I've shown this to you in every way. Because unlike the super apostles, he shows that he really gets the gospel in his speech and presumably in his life. Watch out for those who might be great speakers, but who don't show that they get the gospel about Jesus. So watch out for triumphalism, first in showy speech. And then Paul goes on to talk about money from verse 8, uh, from verse. Seven, sorry. I think it's a bit harder to unpack. Uh, Verse seven, Paul says, Was it a sin for me to lower myself in order to elevate you by preaching the gospel of God to you free of charge? Imagine two degree courses. One costs £40,000 per year and the other £500. You know which one you think might be better. Or two sandwiches, uh, one that costs £20 or one that's given out for free. You know which one you think will probably be better. The Corinthians are sceptical and offended that Paul would preach the gospel for free. If he charges more, presumably he's offering a better product. The super apostles charge money. But for a few reasons, preaching for free means Paul isn't just under the thumb of the richest members of the church. It means he's not competing with the super apostles to be more impressive. And preaching the gospel for free, and this is so key, is because that's exactly what the gospel is about. If Paul is charging money to hear about Jesus, in his method even, he's totally misrepresenting what the good news about Jesus is all about. Do you remember chapter 8, verse 9? We had it a couple of weeks ago when Paul was talking about money before. He said, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. If the gospel is good news about Jesus being freely generous out of love, Paul has got to share that message free of charge. Imagine a strange, horrible world where you have to buy a ticket to come to church every week. You pay for your seat, you watch a nice show, and you go away happy. There's so many disasters with that, it's hard to know where to start. Um, But it means that if the preacher says something you don't like, well, you just stop paying and move to somewhere that you do like. Or it means if your friend says they go to a church that is more expensive, so the show is better and the speakers are more eloquent or better looking. Well, if you can pay to afford to go to the other one, why not go there? Or perhaps you're coming as a guest to this church that you have to pay lots of money to come to And you hear the good news about Jesus, that God so loved the world that he would freely and generously give his one and only son. And you're charged 50 pounds to hear that message. Thank you very much. See, it's all gone upside down. The method has to fit the message. And if the message is about Jesus freely giving out of his spiritual riches, then it's crucial this doesn't become a ticketed event to come to That's why, if we have guest service here, when we do, we would never ask for donations. It's why, if you're a guest here today, thank you for coming. We don't want your money. The message is all about Jesus freely giving, so we can't sell tickets to that. But as we see in verse 8 and 9, Paul is financially supported by other churches. Look at verse 8. I robbed other churches by receiving support from them so as to serve you. And when I was with you and needed something, I was not a burden to anyone. For the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied what I needed. When Paul is preaching in one city, he won't take any money from them. He'll do evangelism in that place free of charge. But then if the church is strong, he'll depend on them to support him elsewhere. Um, Do you remember chapters 8 and 9? Paul wanted the Corinthians' money, but that's not even for him. That's to go to poorer churches in Jerusalem. 
And Paul's going to pre- keep preaching for free, even if it offends the Corinthians. Halfway through verse 9, I've kept myself from being a burden to you in any way and will continue to do so. As surely as the truth of Christ is in me, nobody in the regions of Achaia will stop this boasting of mine. Why? Because I do not love you, God knows I do. And I will keep on doing what I'm doing in order to cut the ground from under those who want an opportunity to be considered equal with us in the things they boast about. The final reason Paul would preach for free is because the super apostles won't be able to copy him. They couldn't imagine sinking to Paul's level and preaching the gospel free of charge. That would be humiliating and it would destroy their business model. So if Paul is preaching the gospel freely, like Christ would, it cuts the ground out from under the super apostles. Like the Corinthians, we must watch out for what looks impressive, because it could just be going against all that Jesus is really about. Whether it's in preachers with eloquent yet empty words, or preachers that charge lots of money for a great show, Those are questionable and deadly serious things. While this is written, firstly, obviously to Corinth, and so has the particular dangers there in mind, we must be careful to think about what looks impressive in the world today, but perhaps particularly impressive in Cambridge. Are we tempted to a Christianity which just copies the impressiveness out there in the world, and yet in doing so is liable to skip over bits of the gospel which show weakness or humility. Remember your betrothal. Watch out for triumphalism. Our third and final point, looking at verse 13 to 15, flee the deceivers. See, I don't know about you. I've been challenged by this this week, but I could easily think that having a bit of a dodgy preacher is not that big of a deal because I can just filter in what they're saying or I'll just plan to leave the church in a little bit or or maybe it doesn't even really matter that much anyway. But Paul says that false teaching is super, super serious. And this isn't just a preacher who mistakenly gets a point wrong. This is people who are deliberately preaching something that is not right and is not Christ crucified. Verse 13, for such people are false apostles, deceitful workers masquerading as apostles of Christ. These are people putting on a disguise to look impressive and hide the truth. See, false teachers don't wear t-shirts that say, I'm a false teacher. Sheep will flee from a wolf. That's an obvious danger. But it's the wolf in sheep's clothing that is particularly dangerous because it's wearing the sheep's clothing. They're masquerading. Look at verse 14 with me. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. See, it's a big deal, right, for Paul to compare the super apostles to Satan. But the stakes are high. This is really serious and it is evil. It connects back to verse 3, the snake's cunning. But even Satan himself masquerading as an angel of light Light looks exciting and brilliant, but this angel of light is totally false and totally evil. The gospel of Jesus, his freely given life out of love for those who were his enemies, turns the world upside down. Rather than serving yourself or your own reputation, it's about generous, selfless giving. It's about suffering for your friends and for your enemies. It's about weakness and love and surrender. And so when the super apostles have their triumphalism, their super eloquent speaking and charging loads of money because they're worth that, it's not just that their method is a bit off. They've totally lost what the gospel is all about. Christ crucified has entirely disappeared from their method and their message. The gospel turns the world upside down. So if you turn the gospel upside down, you'll end up looking just like the world. Or if the church looks too much like the world, well, we've probably lost the gospel. That might be true for the Corinthians with their 
triumphalist, super impressive traveling speakers with eloquent words and charging lots of money. But it could be true for us, where successful church looks indistinguishable from, say, successful academic conventions, or a successful stage show, or a successful business meeting. Let me be clear, when the gospel is about Christ crucified, that clashes with a culture that supports celebrity pastors or church gatherings just being cool shows. You might have heard of an Instagram account, it's almost a bit silly, Preachers and Sneakers, where they show pastors preaching at church services wearing Louis Vuitton, how do you say that, glasses, and 1,100 pound shoes. Or, you know, smoke machines and celebrity attendees, or the coolest media teams. And even if we think those things are a bit ridiculous, we need to be careful that we don't think we want those things just a bit, envying or grumbling somewhere deep inside. I should say, this is not talking about trying to be high quality. This is talking about being impressive just for impressiveness's sake. But dare I say it, I don't think Stag are about to install smoke machines, or it's very likely that Alistair will wear Yeezy sneakers sometime. Um, <laughs> Which is great. I'm really thankful for pastors in this church family who really care about what's going on here, who could throw their weight around more and be focused on building a reputation or gaining a big following. But we must be careful too, individually and as a church. There are ways in which, I guess in our Cambridge context, we could just want speakers or leaders who are very impressive the way we judge someone entirely by their academic career or how many books they've written. We must be careful to make sure that we prize most is the true gospel and not just cool, even evangelical Christian celebrities. The gospel has got to be clear in our methods, in our message, and in the lives of those who teach us. And if you're moving away to a new church soon, And please don't choose one just based on a celebrity name or a really good show, but one on faithful teaching and living in light of the gospel. Paul is desperate for the Corinthians to beware of the super apostles. Remember your betrothal to Christ, watch out for triumphalism, and flee the deceivers. Brothers and sisters, do you know how much this matters? That we see the real danger of those who distort the gospel and that we stick closely to Christ. Let me pray for us. Father, please help us to see the danger of false teaching and instead to treasure Christ. Thank you for those who show us Jesus faithfully. Please help us to trust them. And please guard us as a church to treasure more than any worldly greatness the good news about Jesus. Amen.